Welcome to Still Plays Galaxy of Heroes. This is The Talk. Today we are covering these topics. Mon Mothma has been released. We're going to quickly break down the kit, give my thoughts on potential squads, and some thoughts that have come up. Uh, then we're transitioning into 3v3 Grand Arena, and primarily just break down uh, the teams I put on defense. Then we're going to be doing my gearing uh, for the week. Wasn't planning on doing it so quickly, uh, but because of this character release, we have kind of accelerated the release of this video. Before we move on, uh, I just want to say that the release of Mon Mothma is great news and has really elevated my confidence in the game for a while. I think most to all of us have been becoming very discouraged with the game, but what we have seen recently is the release of several, several new characters and the rework of Vader. What that is telling me is that EA is comfortable with CG putting money into the game because these character releases and these reworks, as CG has previously said and I think makes sense, takes a lot of man hours because you, there is the chance for breaking the game. So you have to do a lot of work in crafting these kits, coming up with them, and then checking for potential game-breaking interactions. And then you also have to be aware of power creep and then all those issues with nesting dials and how the game is going to evolve over time. So the fact that we have gotten so many releases of new characters in the past several months is telling me that CG is confident in this game for at least the foreseeable future. First up is Mon Mothma. She is a two Zeta character support, a leader who cannot be targeted. We don't read through kits here, but we are going to quickly touch upon the abilities. Uh, one thing I do want to say is the developer insights aren't typically that interesting, but in this case I found it to be a lot more interesting than they are normally because this character is so unique. Uh, so first up we have a basic that cleanses debuffs on the weakest ally. We have a special that uh, rallies the, the team, Rebel Fighters specifically. Uh, special 2 summons the trooper and then if the trooper is already on the field then promotes the trooper. The leader shares stats and then uh, there is a 100% chance for an ally, a rebel fighter ally to assist. Then we have the first unique which has the second Zeta which is basically just plus 50 speed. The other verbiage uh, is she's immune to taunt effects so you can target the assist in different ways but that's less interesting to me. The second unique is related to the rebel trooper and what we're seeing here is a dispel on the basic, a second rally, and then additional shared stats. So this is how I like to break down kits on this channel. We did this for the first time during the 3PO Chewbacca video, and I think this is pretty effective. Let me know if this is helpful for you guys. I like to do it this way. It helps me theory craft a little bit better to kind of get rid of all the extraneous verbiage that CG uses. So, the bit, well, first up, we should say that the way CG does things, they say there is a dispel of debuffs on allies, dispel of buffs on enemies. I think that gets a little confusing. So what we're saying is cleanse debuffs on allies, dispel buffs on enemies. That's how we're going to be talking about things on this channel moving forward. We may have to say this again. So the basic cleanses the weakest ally. First special revives a random rebel fighter at 40% health and protection, then equalizes the health, then rallies rebel fighters. Uh, that is, attackers will attack, tanks get crit hit immunity, and support shares a little bit of health and protection. Second special summons the rebel trooper. The trooper is then promoted from trooper to officer to commander. If the trooper is a commander, he then cleanses, he recovers health and protection, and reduces cooldowns on rebel fighters. The leadership Zeta has a stat gain 
of health, protection, defense, offense, tenacity, potency. Uh, and then Rebel Fighters assist with a 90% less damage uh, on an attack ability, 45%. Uh, less damage if it's a support ability and that's a limit once per turn so I think what that is saying is one character will assist it's not a mass assist the next as we said is a plus 50 speed plus Mon Mothma is immune to taunt so she can be targeting other characters and then the second as we mentioned is related to the rebel trooper So my thoughts on this character and this kit. First thing we need to touch upon is Scarif Rebel Pathfinder is getting a small change to the basic. They're saying that because of the old 15% turn meter gain on all Rebel allies that they need to change the basic so that now basic is going to no longer give the plus 15% turn meter but is instead going to give potency up to someone. And remember, there's going to be a lot of assists going on. Someone is going to be assisting on every turn so that Scarifable Pathfinder is likely to give somebody assist and most of the team potency up, up uh, within a couple turns. Now, this is, to me, very telling. The potential loop is, is a clue that Scarifable Pathfinder is one of the characters that they think is going to be intended for whatever best Mon Mothma Rebel Fighter team that is going to exist for this squad. It's not just the turn meter, because if the turn meter was an issue, then, then what we would see is this. We would see that Hoth Rebel Scout would also be altered if the infinite loop was the sole issue because Hoth Rebel Scout also has a 40% chance for a 25% turn meter gain for all allies and Hoth Rebel Scout is not getting touched. It's not just the infinite loop. It's that they think the infinite loop is a potential issue because Scarif Rebel Pathfinder is who they want on this squad. And the reason they want Hoth Rebel... Uh, not, the reason they want... Scarifable Pathfinder on this squad is because of the revive. What you have is a potential synergy, and the potency up is a key part of this, synergy with Cara Dune, because Cara Dune revives a self-revive if she has potency up. So now you have a scenario, a scenario where this is your potential squad, where you have Mon Mothma as your leader, you have Cara Dune, as a tank, you have Scarif Rebel Pathfinder as a second tank, so you have two tanks taunting off of each other that you can't target who you want. Then you have 3PO Chewbacca on the field, and that has this nesting doll effect because 3PO Chewbacca, remember, in is going to be assisting all the time as well because of his unique and abilities that will allow him to assist when a Rebel uses an ability, and then will revive himself when someone else gets revived. So if you take out Cara Dune and you take out 3PO Chewbacca, what if Mon Mothma will have an ability to revive somebody? If you take out 3PO Chewbacca and then you take out Cara Dune and she revives, then Chewbacca will come back on his, on his own. Then if you take out 3PO Chewbacca, you take out Cara Dune, then you take out Scarif Rebel Pathfinder, Scarif Rebel Pathfinder could revive and then everybody comes back onto the field. So the potential synergies between those characters could be unbelievably annoying where you can't take out anybody unless you have buff immunity. And buff immunity, I think, is going to be very important to countering this team. Then the question becomes, who goes into the fifth, fifth slot? So I've broke, broken this down, you have your Rebel Fighter tanks, you have your Rebel Fighter attackers, your Rebel Fighter support characters. The most interesting ones are going to be Cassian, Jin, Lando, and Pow. They talked about a few others, like Wedge is not interesting to me. He doesn't do enough. They, the only reason they gave was because he's an attacker. Well, Lando is an attacker with similar abilities, but Lando 
A lot of people are going to gear up anyway because of Jedi Knight Luke. And on top of that, his, his mass attack will be resetting all the time if he's getting critical hits with it. Jin gets interesting because Jin has a lot of control abilities. Jin can remove turn meter, Jin can put down stuns, and Jin adds a second uh, revive if Mon Mothma's on cooldown and you're in a bad scenario where you've lost Cara Dune, Scare of Rebel Pathfinder, and Three Baka. On top of that, Jin can also be giving 100% turn meter to whoever probably Three Baka would make the most sense, and then with that 100% turn meter, you're effectively getting through the cooldowns faster and getting to be able to use the big attacks and big abilities quicker. Cassian is nice because he is a support character, so then along with the Rebel Trooper, you have a tank, an attacker, and a support character on the field, and then Cassian has an ability block, he has buff immunity, he throws a bunch of debuffs onto the field. He is a nice character, and he has a strong, uh, two strong attack abilities, so he's not going to be too weak. Pow becomes interesting, particularly if you put on the Zeta, because he potentially could be taking a ton of turns because he has a lot of turn meter abilities. They speak about his turn meter ability uh, in the developer insights, but it's all self turn meter, so. It's really, if Pow will be taking enough turns, it's really going to come down to the shared stats from 3PO Chuba, from 3 Baka, and the shared stats from the Rebel Trooper, and the shared stats from Mon Mothma, if Pow becomes powerful enough at that point where he becomes worth putting on the squad. So we're back to 3v3 Grand Arena. I finished the last Grand Arena undefeated with a... I think number 23 overall finish or number 28 overall finish, I forget exactly. We're going to try and repeat with another undefeated season and see if we can break uh, my record and get even higher. Feats are going to be a lot harder. The trooper feats wouldn't be that difficult in a 5v5 setting, but in a 3v3 setting, feats are going to be hell this time around. Uh, Veer's doesn't work as well when there aren't as many troopers to do that damage and to get that turn meter train going. So who I'm going to be using on defense, we have here Shock T with Arc Trooper and Echo. We have Hux going to be joining my first order. I was thinking about maybe using Kylo, uh, OG Kylo, but we're going to put in Fox this first time around, see how my opponent does with it. Although this first opponent uh, has a tough matchup, so I don't know how, how informative this matchup is going to be for overall and future uh, matchups. Uh, just your basic Mother Telzin team. The Bounty Hunter team, though, I want to see a little bit more. I took Dangar out. Uh, and put in Karga. Karga, I think, is going to make this team a lot harder and a little bit more interesting. Mods, I think I need to work on my Boba Fett mods a lot more. Um, work on... Uh, and then see, maybe Django works better as the lead because of just the speed, but I wanted to use Django on offense. In 3v3, I really like to have Django on offense just because of being able to ignore taunt and be able to take out Night Sisters a little bit more easily. This territory here, this new Gunray team was huge for me last 3v3 Grand Arena. I'm hoping he still gives everyone a lot of trouble this time around. This Bastila team, uh, not everybody uses it, but it's been sh on other people's videos before. This is a great team. People underestimate it, it becomes a big pain to deal with, uh, and Hermit Yoda makes Ezra do a lot more damage. And I wasn't planning on putting the Zeta on Ezra, but it's not a bad Zeta. Uh, and in these 3v3 scenarios is where that Zeta on Ezra becomes very helpful to really just expand the depth and strength of your roster. And then this is another typical Night Sister team. 
I want to get my spirit up a lot higher. Spirit becomes awesome when relic. Down the back wall. Grievous, this evasion team. I, t I wish I knew who I took this team from. Someone a long time ago, uh, when 3v3 first became a thing, had a YouTube video about some quirky teams. And this was one of the teams on that video. Uh, and it's done great for me. The, the idea here is you have two taunts, you have increased evasion, and then you have Droidica just taking people out. It would be better if Chopper was higher gear and Droidica was higher gear, but I've still given plenty of people trouble with this team, even when I had Old Ben at lower gear. Then this standard Palpatine team and a standard Padme team that people very often set on defense. Uh, from there we are going to go into the gearing. So this gearing is happening a little bit faster than I was previously anticipating because I just released one of these talk videos a few days ago. Actually, I guess it's been about a week. Uh, but I haven't been able to replenish my horde since the last time. But I did a little bit of looking into Resistance Hero Finn and looking at where my gear is at and considering I just have to throw this stun gun on, I can bring him up to gear 11 uh, right now on this video, so we are going to be doing that. This piece, by the way, my accumulation of it has been slower since I've joined a new guild and I'm not finishing as high in uh, the tank raid. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting a lot fewer of these, so I've been buying a lot more of them out of the shard shop. Something that I keep, I'm going to be keeping in mind for the future is this piece might be a little bit more rare for me because of tank raid performance. Let's throw these pieces on. I've been buying as many of those as I can. This is another piece that is a great shard shop piece. You, you can't get it from uh, the guild store, so the shard shop becomes one of the most convenient places to now get it without crystals or using uh, other currency. Alright, we've hit gear 11, so we are going to stop on Resistance Hero Finn until later. As I've said in previous videos, gear 11 is my staging ground. Everybody goes there, then I decide which squads I want to work on. I'm not going to be working on the Galactic Legends until every single required character has reached gear 11. Then I'm going to selectively choose which ones get moved up into gear 12 and the character and the way in which I'm prioritizing which resistance character or which first order character gets brought up to gear 11 first is based on uh, who is more recent because these recent kits are more valuable so now Poe is becoming my new priority I think I can get him up too. I just need to make a determination of how many of these stun guns and carbs I want to spend. But where I have the gear right now, I, he doesn't need too much more, and I think gear 10 is not that bad for him. I need to put the Zeta on, but uh, next time around I can be using the Resistance Heroes. I've gone through way more of those than I have in a long time. Alright, I still got plenty of those. We're just going up to 11 be done with another character. Alright, 
Probably shouldn't put that on actually. We've hit 11, we can just stop for now. Checking if there's anything easy. All right, Poe is done. Since we've gotten to this level, we're gonna put on the Omegas. And, you know what? Putting on this Zeta, I wasn't sure about this one since I'm just not familiar with these kits well enough. But looking at Arnold's ranking of all the Zetas, this one was in was the, the Erodium tier, the second best tier. So we're just going to go ahead and put this one on. So next week in Grand Arena, we'll be able to test out Poe since I haven't used him at all to this point. And from there, we're going to probably call it for this video. Cody's only here because of light side Gia's just slowly working on these characters, but I'm, I'm low on cuffs, so I'm not going to be working on him. Here, I just want to get to gear 11 and move on, but that's 200 carbs right there. We're not touching her. Sith Trooper, we're not touching. Mandalorian is going to wait. Yeah, all right, that's going to call it for this week. That's enough gear. Thank you for watching. This has been Still Plays Galaxy of Heroes. Be safe out there, everyone, and be excellent to each other.